What I have um, in my understanding of fun today, what I have in mind to do is um, speak briefly about the point in the book that uh, I simultaneously consider it uh, to be very interesting for me, while also not fully understanding what I'm writing. Uh, so it's something that I want to keep on thinking about. We were also mentioning it before, that the writing is something you use in order to understand something that you're having trouble to, to figure out and to pick up. So that's been something that I, uh, I'm not having trouble in the, in the, in the sense of, the, yeah, I can, I can see what I'm saying, but uh, I, I would like to continue thinking about it because I, I still haven't settled my thoughts on it. And I hope I will not settle the thoughts on it. So with that, that in mind, a, a very brief, because Heidi was mentioning the, 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 the book as an overview, and uh, I'm just gonna, yeah, very briefly show you the table of contents. Not to, uh, not to go through each one of them, but uh, just to show you where exactly I'm going to be focusing now for this small talk. Uh, these are the table of contents. They all try to cover this. Uh, the one architecture's problem is more or less what we could call traditional in introduction. And it is in there that Heidi's, uh, Heidi's mentioned to how is this architecture possible. It's in there, but it's laid out. And then the second part of this one, stuttering, uh, has to do with uh, perhaps thinking of ways that the one could uh, approach architecture non-representationally, so without uh, focusing on representation and annotation, and not the other means of the tradition associated with architecture. Uh, then technicities, which is also happening to be in the title of the book, uh, it's a concept taken from Simon Dori. I don't think I need to explain it because most of you probably heard me many times speaking about it. Uh, it's appearing here, more or less in the middle of the book, connected with intuitions. <laughs> And then uh, we're going on a discussion that is, this is the part where I was troubled myself with uh, whether I go on this last part or here. Uh, this is where the membrane appears, which is, I think, from what I understood, even if I'm not sure, probably what Andre is gonna speak about today, but that's a bet I'm willing to take. And uh, on the last part, which is where I'm gonna focus, which is the larval space, uh, the, 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 the one which is the shortest chapter of the book, but also I consider to be the most densely written and I'm speaking about it as if somebody else wrote it, so I don't uh, say it in any flattering for me sense. Uh, it's densely written because I could not have written it uh, in any other way, because that's how it came to be. It was not a decision, that's what I'm saying. It was the topic that was leading to that. And the topic of that last part is uh, this time, but in a non-temporal sense, if I can speak about it like that, uh, which is a peculiar way to speak about time, and that's what I'm going to try to speak about today also how time in thinking architecturally and doing architecturally loses its temporality. I mean, again, this is a bit of an improvisational uh, description that I'm giving now. My notes are gonna be better on, uh, on following it. So it's this small part that I'm gonna focus uh, in this 10 minute thing today, uh, in this brief history of architectural time. And I'm gonna start with a quote, uh, but it's not, in, uh, but it's not in, uh, in the book itself. And it's from a guy that uh, it's a very good thing that he's becoming a bit more popular lately, and it's uh, Raymond Ruyer. And uh, in, uh, in this quote of Ruyer uh, from his uh, There is no subconscious uh, piece uh, from uh, 1988, it's actually, uh, Ruyer goes on and says that every authentic form is in time and also in space. It uh, persists in time by translating a potential, a temporal, into space. Embryogenesis is mnemic, the potential is a memory. The theme is not a vital animation, a creative breath recommencing in its individual, being the mythical breath of uh, any kind of God. There is no individualizing and telechy. The life-giving breath is organic memory. If there is a breath, it's more like the action of a theater prompter, which is nothing more than the memory of a species. Potential is not mimic only, but it's also inventive. So that's a basis that I'm taking, and I was not aware of a text uh, I think it was by Dan to Andre and by Andre to me that I came up with this text very within the last couple of months, I think. Um, and uh, I was not aware of that text and of that code when I was writing that, uh, that, that chapter, but it's, uh, it's, it stands very close with other pieces that uh, Ruyer has written, and it's very close to, to the interest that Ruyer had uh, throughout, his, uh, throughout his life and throughout his uh, thinking career. Uh, I'm going to complement this piece of Ruyer with some other pieces by some other thinkers, again, in a very quick manner. And I'm going to try to take it into architecture and to architecture as a practice, actually. Uh, what Ruger basically was saying and how I understand him is that a, a hand, like the hand we all have, uh, and a building, like the one that we are in now, are not just uh, an aggregation, a collection of parts. So they're not just pieces brought together. 
Uh, it's not just a collection of different snapshots in time over development that you would see horizontally, as you usually see, like a collection of snapshots. But actually, the first brick laid somewhere in the complete building that we are in, the link, as it just emerges from a, and it's funny to do it here, but as it just emerges from an embryo, and the actually formed hand of the infant, are simultaneously both the starting point and the end of one single and continuous line of development. Okay? They are both parts of a melody. That's how one would understand them. But it's a peculiar melody because it's a melody that unfolds in time, moment by moment, but the listener only knows it fully when it's completed and only recognizes it as a genuine melody opposed to a random sequence of notes. When its overall design is grasped, that design or shape being imminent, we take the melody from beginning to an end. In a sense, the melody as a shape exists outside chronometric time. Already, this is the first <coughs> time. An idea that manifests itself moment by moment in the act of it, in performance. So instead of grasping uh, that melody as the horizontal sequence that you would read when you would read the, the notes in the, in the, in the paper of the, of the melody of the part tour, let's say, uh, you can actually think of these notes of the whole melody now as something that can be thought vertically, that can be grasped vertically. So the first note would be folding on the last, and all those notes would be manifested could be expressed at any line in the performance, all coming out, squeezed out, that's what expression stands for, at any consecutive point of this horizontal timeline. So literally take a partiture and compress it, like fold it from beginning to beginning. <laughs> so in other words, when performed, this actual melody is nothing but a temporal unfolding of a continuous Melodic idea, let's call it like that. Uh, others, like Simon Don would call it a membranic melodic idea, but we probably would not go to that. I don't know, unless Andre has a different membranic idea as well about uh, Simon Don today. And this is exactly Ruyer's verticalism. His verticalism, which is a very important concept for him, is that a melody slash idea understood like this coming together of beginning and end, folded upon each other actually is what directs any intentional individuation, is what directs any purposeful becoming, to use a closer to the less a term. You get what I'm saying by this verticalism, right? Or do I need to spend more time on that? Okay, okay, good. Either in the hand, therefore, or in a building, this melody that thinks itself exists as a mimic theme, a melodic theme, a virtual form, as the less might have had it, that becomes progressively actualized, gets to come here with us through diverse technicities. That's where technicities enter the, the, the point. I'm not going to explain, but technicities is basically any way that an organism by a technology intervenes to its environment, and by intervening to its environment, they change both organism, technology, and environment itself. So Ruyer, in a very brief manner, distinguishes between three kinds of technicities, which is our organs. He can call them originary technicities. Then we have externalized organs, not just the internal ones, which is an extended phenotype. That's what he refers to. And then lastly, we have detachable artifacts, which is a chair, for example, that they themselves enter into a circuit, enter into, into a connective uh, loop, let's say, but is actually external to the individual. So to give a brief example, an organ is the hand, as we were referring before. An externalized organ is the spider's web, that the spider is webbing. And the last one, the detachable one, is actually a house. And the funny thing is that all these hand spiders, webs, and houses, they all individuate together. They all work with one another. And they're all different levels of these technicities. And precisely what they share in common, the hand that comes from the, from the infant, the web of the spider in the corner, and the house that was built, is that they're all purposeful. So there is a purpose behind them all. None of this is happening by chance. Okay? There is an intention behind all this, not necessarily to be confused with a conscious human, conscious, let's say, intention in there. In their coming together, and precisely because they come together, there is a moment where a radical transformation happens. And that is the moment where memory itself becomes detachable. So memory gets externalized to a degree that it itself becomes detachable. As Ruger says, the main difference between physical beings and the most complex organism does not probably derive from the instantaneity or the absence of memory in the former, but from a lack of detachment of this memory, which is only ever the form in time and does not constitute a transpatial reserve. That's from the actual. 
in human beings, memory constitutes other cells, other eyes, that enrich the actual eye, the actual cell. So, Ruyer would differentiate individuals according to the degree of detachment of their memory as expressed in their technicities. So, why, for example, atoms lack a detachable memory since they do not need one? Because they're a continuous and uninterrupted activity. That's why they don't need any memory. They're continuous in action. More complex individuals like humans make use of gradually detachable forms of memory. So this, I mean, again, I suppose you've heard it from us quite often, these three types of memory, which go under the name of genetic, epigenetic, epipilogenetic, we can discuss it later. I'm not going to spend so much time on this now, can be also approached from how detachable each one of them is. Genetic is not detachable. Epigenetic stands in the middle. Epiphylogenetic is fully detachable. Due to their degree of detachment, this last part of the epiphylogenetic memory, which we can also call it not fully human, but it is what we can, again, simplify and call human technicities, human memory, becomes able to radically transform the relationship of us as species with our environment. How is this happening? It's happening precisely because the technicities, and I'm referring to any design technicities for the sake of uh, for the sake of my profession here and for the faculty where in architecture, let's say, technicities, uh, design technicities give human individuals access to what, again, Deleuze would call the refrain. I'm not going to explain it very thoroughly now. You can imagine it as something that comes together back, but always a bit differently. So it's the refrain, the coming together, but always a bit differently, of a memory, of a melody that actually sings itself. It's not sung by anyone else. It sinks itself. And the detachability of that memory, so the thing that this memory is expressed in the form of artifacts, which are detachable, actually simultaneously intensifies that melody, intensifies that memory. Artifacts like a chair, which is basically the, the, the detachable storage of the problem, how do we extend the ground in order to sit? So artifacts like a chair not only store the memory of <laughs> any solution, but also the function as synapses, the function as moments that things come together. Through technicities, our architectural minds and intentions, they meet impersonable, impersonal, imperishable, and detached architectural objects, like a room or a chair, as well as their corresponding norms and values, because there is things that you can do and not do in a room or in a chair. And doing so, they break this parallelism between the actual and the virtual. And the breaking of parallelism, you can imagine it as what Ruyer was calling the opposite, verticalism. They fold actually this sheet of notes from start to beginning into one go. They fold the fibers of the membranic cosmos, again, to use a similar term, <laughs> by squeezing out of it an architecture that is always just about to come. It's always one step ahead of us. In the reciprocity of an extended architectural mind of our architectural practices, and also in an architectural technicity, the way that the two meet together, the architect and its technicities, there emerges an architectural consciousness, that's what I'm trying to say, a design consciousness, which, like any kind of consciousness, has the capacity to act and perform, Luger would say, an absolute survey, an absolute overview of its own domain. And therefore, it can make itself simply by making, it can make itself simply by memorizing, and it can make itself simply by imitating what its future form is going to be. When you're designing, you're always designing something that's futural. Okay? You're always trying to figure out what's important about that futural form. In the evolution of these design technicities, what is astonishing and what makes them different, especially in architecture than other forms of technicities, is that, is that they present an almost absolute verticalism. So the verticalism of architectural technicities is even more radical than other let's say, I'm not going to call it lesser, but other more minor forms of design. So while biological evolution manifests itself vertically in a long duration, in which different types of memory span throughout time to allow an organism to make itself purposefully, technical evolution operates in a much less predictable manner. So emerging architectural styles or techniques of production, forgotten practices of the past and avant-garde parametricism, Computer aided design and the streets of Pompeii, as you can see here, all highlight the rapid individuations of architectural technicities. This absolute verticalism that the end and the beginning meet each other, fold upon each other, compared, let's say, to the verticalism, the end and the beginning of biological evolution, 
consists in the fact that technical objects, which are artifacts of detachable memory, have the capacity to operate at an absolute speed. They are mobile singularities of memory convergence, as I was speaking about the chair before. A chair is the convergence, is the expression of the memory, a detachable singular memory of how do we deal with the issue of elevating the ground. The same that you can do for a house, the same you can do for a street, the same you can do for a wall. So this verticalism actually implies a drastic shift, meaning that if their melody, this melody that they have, this mimic theme, if it can be sung in any kind of different key and still makes sense, if the start and the end constantly coincide with one another, then technical individuals are not just what allow us to break the parallelism, to make the virtual come to the actual and the other way around, but they actually allow us to become a future that we do not yet see right here in front of us. They allow us to grasp the purpose that we do not yet know that we want or we have. And they actually allow us to figure out the intention but we do not yet feel. In other words, these technical individuals, and again, think of that thing, which is from 2000 years ago, are always coming from the future, the future of people wanting to do things when they are discovered even in archeological excavations. So what you're seeing there is actual intentions. Intentions are always future, that's what I'm saying. Even when they're discovered from 2000 years ago, what you're discovering in an excavation is intentionality. And this intentionality, understanding architecture as such, it's actually always from a future but beyond chronological time. It's not measured in the day after or in two days down the road. Can I continue for a bit? Yeah, I have just a bit more. Okay. So in the architectural act, because architecture is about the act of it, it does not exist, one would say, besides it, and the work that it implies, <coughs> architecture is not producing just its technicities, its norms and its values, but actually architecture allows itself to rearrange itself without erasing, erasing itself. What I'm trying to say is that any moment that one via technicities designs, in a way you're both basing yourself and your design on everything that has happened before, <laughs> without erasing what has happened before, and simultaneously drastically, drastically altering what has happened before. It's a continuous process of making itself and remaking itself and remaking itself. In this process, you can have that memory that I'm referring to, that impersonal memory of this larval condition, this larval space, and you can have it expressed as at once genetic, epigenetic, and epiphylogenetic. Again, we can discuss this later, what these three things stand for. After all, larval space, this moment of creation, let's call it like that, intentional creation, is not hidden in any distant region that would require treating it as something that is beyond reach and that you need to go and grasp it only if you are an authority, a place that is meant only for experts, owners of big offices or famous designers. Quite the opposite, this larval space is not a domain, it's not a beyond that you have to grasp. It's not placed next to this or that kind of thing. It's not actually even a starting point or a destination that one aims. Larval space is simply where and when the start and the end fold upon each other. It's this moment where start and end fold upon each other. Any moment of design creation, in other words. And for this reason, it is actually everywhere and simultaneously, everywhere and at once. It is the architectural act itself and its intentional capacity to fight against entropy, against the dissipation of energy, while also, however, conforming with its own history, because you need to conform to what has happened in the past. To become other, to become different, by opening to the world and not by closing upon yourself as a designer, as an architect. Any act of architecture is larval because it manages to capture and express, squeeze out, the indeterminacy of the cosmos, the openness of the cosmos. And this is what architecture can teach us, that the cosmos might be materially and energetically closed because no matter can get in and out, no energy gets in and out. This is the first and second law of thermodynamics, but it always remains relationally open. In other words, while no matter and energy can be introduced or disappear, there is literally no limit when it comes to the potential relations between them, between matter and energy. The cosmos is actually infinite in that sense. So as Deacon is saying, while we might speculate that the conservation of laws of science tells us that the universe is close to the creation or destruction of the amount of possible difference, which is the relationship between matter and energy, that's what difference stands for Deacon. 
available in the world. They do not, however, restrict the distributional possibilities that these differences, these relations can take. And these relationships determine the forms that change can also take. So the indeterminacy, the openness of relations, that anything can relate to anything in any kind of way, actually highlights the importance of architectural, what I like to call architectural information, but information without going into detail, not in the data fight sense of it, information in the more old school understanding of it as anything that can inform something, anything that has meaning. Bateson was calling information as a difference that can make a difference. So another way to understand information in this sense is a relation as the ones that Deacon here was describing, but can have an effect. So if a relation can have an effect, it's informative. So information actually is the only thing that escapes the natural laws of matter and energy being closed to the internet and allows the cosmos to individuate further, to individuate differently. Information as a shared meaning that we share with one another is actually the only thing that can be introduced or disappear from the universe. The only thing that we can introduce or take away from this world, from the cosmos, is relations that can have an effect. So through these relational leaps of a difference that can make a difference, from one individual to another, from one domain to another, one scale to another, one field to another, there are created casual links between phenomena that otherwise would be astronomically unlikely to occur spontaneously. Okay? So our intentionality is expressed in relations. Relations are also the expression of our intentionality. Similarly, architectural information is actually what allows architecture to go further, to go further individuating. One step after the other, one architectural act after the other, information in architecture propagates the synapses, the connections that assist the constant effort of coupling together all these different types of memory that I was mentioning. Genetic, epigenetic, epiphylogenetic. I'm finishing, so not much more there. It was a light thing that I brought in, right? Yes. Yeah. So architecture depends on architectural technicities because they are the actual expressions of its norms and values. And they, these technicities, like a chair, I repeat again, can be preserved unmodified across changes in dynamics so that earlier achievements will not continuously be undermined. The detachable memory of architectural technicities, design technicities, let's call them like that, and the absolute verticalism that it entails allows architecture to evolve since this memory, the memory of the architectural act itself, provides architecture with constraints that can inform one another at an absolute speed. You might not get it, but this is you being informed. You might not get it, I mean, immediately as, as something that is obvious, but it becomes very obvious. This is you being informed about the problem and its solution that has been produced in its own right as a constraint eventually some thousands of years ago. This is what I mean by breaking any kind of linearity in time. This chair is directly informing you right now. It's a constraint that affects over constraints in a manner not beyond just spatial scale, but also beyond temporal scale. So, to put it differently, the capacity of any architectural technician to connect the local, like you here, with the non-local, like that chair some thousand of years ago, or that street some thousand of years ago, makes possible not just the discourse we can have on architecture, but also the architectural life itself. We are architecting because of this local, non-local continues coming together. That's expressed here or there. Due to its own cautiousness, architecture can take advantage of informationally charged moments like these synapses in order to actually express a novel line of individuation. Eventually, only in the end, allowing an architectural, let's call it semiosis, a discourse to emerge. So a population of meanings that would allow architecture to actually enunciate, create itself, without reducing eventually itself to just a style, a school of thought, or any kind of specific megastar or ideology. Through the act itself, the architectural act, the asymmetry between the actual and the virtual is eventually expressed as a potential of an architecture that will always belong to the future, even when it's of the past, hundreds of years ago, forsaken ruins and old pictures only being there to remind us. So the intentionality of architectural act is what makes architecture able to inform and be informed by this larval moment, by this larval space, and also to address a larval moment and a larval space, but it's still undecided as to where it came from and where it's going to go. So it's this indeterminate moment. 
the architectural act can modulate much more than just the current material constraints of an already existing architecture. It's able actually to modulate the dynamic constraints, the tendencies of these constraints, the directions that can emerge when a population of architectural assemblages now come in relation. I promise it's the last page. So in this sense, architectural intentionality can be understood as a constant manipulation of meaning, of architectural meaning, of architectural information, a continuous effort to explore, produce, and take advantage of the constraints that allow for a shared architectural sense, a shared architectural meaning to pass through throughout time. Understanding architectural intentionality and agency in terms of information now, in terms of constraints and synapses, in terms of the verticalism of Ruyer, in terms of melodies, in terms of technicities, in terms of detachable artifacts, actually shifts the problematic field of architecture altogether. Because it's no longer an issue, and now some of the people here will laugh because we're discussing it in the studio a lot, it's no longer an issue of what an architect is free from, but actually is an issue of what we are free to. It's about the necessity, uh, where, yeah, it's about the necessity discussion, yes. Any architectural agency stands for the emergent capacity to modulate different lines of individuation in a manner that escapes the tendencies of the current, of the present, and of actually spontaneity. So how things would normally be done or where they would naturally go. In addition, architecture intervenes in the fabric of causality, modulating it intentionally, while actually forming its persistence, its persistence to keep on doing that. Every moment you're architecting, you're also grounding the next architect. And if you're designing, you're producing the conditions of the next design, irrelevant if it's yours or not. What forms an architectural consciousness, because there is a consciousness, it doesn't have, you don't need to connect consciousness with a brain or with a soul or anything like this. There is a consciousness, there is an architectural consciousness in the act itself, in the act of architecture. What forms it is not a given, it's not transferred by any other domain that's bigger than it. But either before or after it supports or drives it. There's no one, no, no authority that can tell you that this is now it. You are now an architect. You can do it. You are now a designer. You can do it. Architecture is self-catalyzing and self-emerging and self-generating. A melody that sings itself in all the different tunes that have been expressed out of the universe up to this point, but also of all the ones that are yet to come. So a consequence that is its own consequence, architectural agency and intentionality depend only on the architectural act itself and its capacity to be attuned, to be in synchronization with a shared meaning that can make a life, any kind of life, worthy of what happens to it, worthy of what happens in it. And accordingly, eventually, memorize it and imitate it. That's what design is. In other words, and that's up for debate with many of the people here, Architecture is not produced or any design is not produced by free will, but by free necessity. Things are there, yeah. That's how I define it. That's how I define it. Yes. Now you move in yeah. this warm day. Yeah. <laughs> we do, Mister. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That it be provoked, as you're saying. Good, good. So, the all to take this technical diversity. I am deeply familiar with Stavros' work as we have been teaching together for several years now. I have had the privilege of observing his intellectual rigor place and his relentless commitment to transdisciplinarity and transversality. As you know, uh, interesting problems, of course, never fall within disciplinary boundaries. It is not uncommon for him to pick up the phone right after a lengthy session to engage in further discussion or, or reflect on missed opportunities to delve deeper into our topic. Many years ago, our colleague Bob, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, earned the nickname of genealogy. 
book genealogy called me or BGG. Following <laughs> this tradition, I would like to propose middle main post studies. And for he shall be known as Talos, Technicity, Kuzmas, or Mr. SPK. During a private conversation a few days ago, I expressed my delight in having an excuse to reread his book on architectural technicity. Now, with the benefit of the author's answer, I'm prepared to highlight what I believe to be the book's primary pedagogical virtues. I will limit myself to three. Not only for the sake of time, but also because I shared a strong inclination for triads with my ATP colleagues, <laughs> all triad maniacs, <laughs> and even with our imaginary friend, the semi addition Charles Sanders Pierce, and possibly our esteemed guest, Dan Smith. <laughs> so, without further ado, first, pragmatism. Stavros strongly embraces philosophical pragmatism, and to say so is an understatement. For him, being a pragmatist means affirming that activity, that is to say, the folding of the membrane, constitutes the entirety of existence. Activity all the way up and all the way down. There's the infinity and the action, and, and activity as relation that produces an unlimited infinity. Despite his occasionally grumpy demeanor, demeanor indicated by the subtle Preaching of his mustache, <laughs> as measured by Paul of Spence, as one of the most optimistic and affirmative architecture theorists. This optimism does not stem from naivety. On the contrary, the pragmatism that he upholds serves as a permanent antidote to fatalism, an ethical endeavor exemplified by Mark Fisher's line that we can envision the end of the world, but, it, but not the end of happening. And an antidote to cybermorphism is Simondonian streak, an aesthetic project in which the architect at the demiurge imposes form upon the matter, not excluding the contemporary data and bits. And, 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 and bits. To use a reference by Michael Hayes, which will be a segue to my second point, uh, that's my second pedagogical virtue, for Kusumas, architecture does not merely act as an epiphenomenon of culture, as a mere effect. Consequence, nor does it function as an autonomous form, a cause, a form in this sense very distinct from the years of cause. Rather, its non essentialist essence lies in quasi causality, a stoic concept deeply intertwined with technicity. And there is this quote from the book, page 182. Any technicity assists in the production of non spontaneous, this is what Flavos meant by escaping natural laws. And underscore non spontaneous change that actualizes the potential coupling the local and the non local, which nonetheless would have remained only virtual if it were not for the technicity itself. And I believe you have actually also questioned this. So the cause is an incorporeal effect, which in turn becomes a quasi cause. The second one, pharmaca, pharmacology. Okay. One valuable lesson I have personally learned. You're good at taking very flattering pictures. <laughs> 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 that I learned directly from them, I was his problem for avoiding hasty biases. As evident from the preceding quote, the virtual is the product of imminence. The distinction between minor and major, major keys, smooth and straight spaces, the virtual and the actual, is not a rigid dichotomy, but rather a reciprocal integration, reciprocation in this sense. So the crucial point, tirelessly emphasized by Kusovas. This, this point cannot be uh, overstated. An ecologically viable approach necessitates an accompanying ethology as an art of dosages that transcends simplistic notions of good and evil. Architecture is not produced by trivial, he says on page 187, but as covered by uh, three necessities. Again, you, you actually use uh, uh, that. Uh, it is crucial to recognize the political purchase of this perspective. As it can easily be misconstrued because no one is off the hook. Taking a third stance in opposition, paradoxically, paradoxically often perpetuates the status quo, and more importantly, robs us of the conceptual tools required to formulate problems. And as we know, uh, problems uh, have solutions today is uh, all, all made. 
Spinoza's timeless query remains pertinent. Why do we fight for our servitude as if it were our salvation? As aptly expressed by Brian Masumi, a sentiment he believes Paros shares, the Vogue moment, movement alone will not be sufficient to rescue. Thus, not only is there no ecology without ontology, but also, to paraphrase Duke Huy, the non spontaneous techno diversity is as crucial as biodiversity. In fact, it can be argued that there would be no new diversity, the diversity of minds, without techno diversity. So this is probably my most important mind today. So no new diversity, new as in NOO mind, without techno diversity. Finally, number three, the evaluation of all others. The fourth and the final chapter of the book is both highly speculative and ambitiously far-reaching. It establishes connections between the concepts of intuition, referred to earlier as a quasi-causality third kind of knowledge, of unhinged time, not merely as a measure of movement, but capable of generating movement itself, which is meant by time, and the post-capitalist notion of value that abolishes uh, generalized equivalence. He says, and I quote, my point is that architecture produces time, one said in the quote. This is where Kusulas delves into the larval stage with a little help from a friend who is yet to be absorbed into architecture theory, Ryan Fourier. So he says, an action can be intentional without being intended, form can indeed beget form without it being at least and state, page 180. In retrospect, we may, we may have prematurely titled our PhD course from a few years ago as uh, Everybody Loves Ruyer, the architecture in your final exam. Nonetheless, thanks to Stavros' uh, diligent efforts, Simon Ruyer has now earned his rightful place on the map of architectural discourse. And I will end by way of ventriloquizing arch tripping with a perverse light. So, Mr. Kusulas, <laughs> the pragmatist who is also a psychotropic pharmacologist and above all, the thinker of N minus one, who always subtracts one for the distorted signal. Tell us, what does all this have to do with architecture? <laughs> before, uh, and, and before you do, uh, uh, give me just one second to uh, announce the two events in September. This year and one next year, we have just learned that Dan will be uh, our guest uh, at the uh, Deleuze and Zachary International Conference in Delft 2024 summertime. So, uh, for thank you, Mr. Dasman. <laughs> I am seeing yes. <laughs> and I realize you take much more pictures of me than I'm going to start cutting copyrights for you or something. So yeah, Dan can give you the shot and then, uh, I mean, on his uh, on his uh, codes, and then we can have a discussion all together. All right, well, thanks. I don't have any pictures or PowerPoint, so I feel, um, uh, but it's uh, great to be here. Thanks to all of you for coming and thanks to Stockers. Do you want me to remove this background or I'll leave it? To... Uh, no, if you want your pictures. You want the pictures, I say yes. <laughs> I can stop sharing the screen then. So, yeah, so people. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I'm not really sharing, so it's fine. It's okay. It's okay. I'll leave it like that. I'll leave it as it is now. Yeah. Um, well, thanks to all of you for coming to Prince Discoverers for uh, uh, writing such a great book. I learned a lot from it. And um, so I'm here today almost by chance because I saw uh, Andre at a, a conference in Rotterdam a few weeks ago and he said, hey, maybe you should come up to tell me it's a book launch. And I said, well, maybe, maybe let me think about it. And then he wrote back, well, you have to decide now because the train tickets are going up. So uh, <laughs> it needs to be a better chance to reply. But he did send me a PDF copy of the book and I looked at it and said, uh, I want to uh, do this. So. Um, I agreed to come, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did. Although I have to say, I am um, not a fan of reading PDF books. I, I, I talked to a student uh, not long ago at Purdue, my university, who told me he has never once read a physical book from cover to cover ever in his life. Uh, it's not that he doesn't read, but he reads everything online or listen to podcasts. And uh, I realized doing this that I have never read a PDF book <laughs> from cover to cover until until now. So uh, somehow I, I entered the 21st century. Um, 
But I wanted to come uh, partly because, you know, Delft is such a, you know, mythic place for me, at least, like architecture and school of technology. But uh, I'm trying to write some stuff on technicity uh, using that word as well. So I thought if I just come here, breathe in the air, that'll help help me think better. So I, it's already working, I, I think. Um, uh, also interested to come because uh, I work in philosophy. So the fact that you're doing all this in the context of architecture, uh, I really wanted to read the book to see how philosophy is being used or yeah. misused. Or misused, but misuse is good. <laughs> Uh, in a different field. So, um, I too have three points. So you're right, uh, triadic and maybe uh, are, are autistic, which are really just things I pulled out from uh, reading the book. I was particularly interested in the title, Larval Space, and so I could tell that came from Riere. And um, just reading the title, I was like, how do you get from Riere to architecture? I think you're saying question. Um, because Riere is a philosopher of biology, he's interested in embryos, and uh, that link took me a while to put together. So that's really the question I, I brought to this book as I, I, I was reading. And just as a side note, before I get to my three points, I don't want to take much time. When I was taking notes, I, I discovered just purely by chance, I was miswriting the word architecture. And sometimes I, I would write architecture. Just, I don't know why. It was like an ex dyslexia with an X or a dysgraphia. And, um, but I found it interesting, so I looked it up. So you probably all know this already because you discussed the origins of the word, but it's from a Proto-Indo-European world text. So of course in Greek, through Greek it becomes techne, uh, which is craftsman stuff. But uh, texture actually is from the same root, but it comes through Latin, textura. So it's a different, you know, same source, but goes in a different direction. And textura, you know, means something like a web network or structure. So it's interesting. <laughs> Architecture is like the operational side that you're talking about, I think coming from Simon Bull, and architecture is more the structural side. So just my agraphia, dyslexia, um, uh, seem to get at a theme in this book, which I, I, I quite like. Um, anyway, so my three points are really uh, uh, totally self-centered. If there are things that struck me as, as reading the book, but they're from the beginning of the book and then the middle of the book and then the end of the book. Which is yeah, because that's really a thing that interests me most here. <clears throat> but the first point comes from the opening line of the book, or almost the opening line. Uh, so I was just trying to do here where he riffs on Bergson, uh, where he says, and says architecture has not yet found its metaphysics. And that too was a puzzle for me. I'm like, what's it mean to have a metaphysics for architecture? Because you know, we philosophers are interested in metaphysics, but um, uh, you probably know this about that term, by the way. You know, it's really a bibliographic term for uh, people when they were cataloging Aristotle's work. He had all these books, and that ended with the physics, and then all these other books. They didn't know what title, what title to use. So they just called the books after the physics. That's what meta means. All the books that came after the physics. But it wound up being a great title because those books dealt with, like, beyond physics, what's the nature of ultimate reality? So it kind of fit metaphysics. Like, what is the nature of ultimate reality? Uh, Deleuze, who I know is a big influence here, at one point calls himself a pure metaphysician, which is a rather provocative claim on his part, because a lot of philosophers in the 20th century were anti-metaphysical. He wanted to overcome metaphysics like Heidegger and, and Derrida. Deleuze says, no, I'm just a pure metaphysician, which is an extraordinary claim, because then you say, well, uh, metaphysics looks at the ultimate nature of reality. You're a metaphysician. That means you have insight into the ultimate nature of reality. And that's essentially what he's saying. And he is saying that. So then if you ask him, well, what exactly is the ultimate nature of reality? He, in fact, has an answer to that question. It's, it's extraordinary, um, but not what you would think, because he says the ultimate nature of reality is it's a problem, <laughs> meaning we don't know the nature of ultimate reality. But that's the structure of ultimate reality. It's a problem. It's constantly giving us problems, generating problems. And I take it this is the starting point of <clears throat> of your uh, book, because then we have to constitute problems in a way. And the Lewis, when he reads philosophers, is always asking, what's the problem? Always something they're conscious about, but it's what's generating their concepts. So if you're a philosopher and you create concepts, because there's a problem, that lies at the heart of what you're doing. If you're a scientist, you scientific functions, as the Lewis says, there's a problem. Or artists are dealing with problems. And so I take Stauber's point here was like, well, architecture too, as a creative activity, is generated by, by a problem. And that's a metaphysical question and an uh, ontological um, 
uh, question. Uh, then my question was, well, what exactly is then the architectural problem? <laughs> and uh, so I looked around and I think I got it, but uh, you know, tell me, tell me if it's right. Because I initially thought, well, architecture deals with, with space, and that's a way of organizing space. But that's not quite right, I think, uh, because it becomes really uh, production, textual production, which is not necessarily uh, the spatial stuff, perhaps, is a, is a product of that. But it's, and I think it's Simon Don, again, tell me if I'm right, but it's the process of individuation. Like you individuate things, you, you create things, but they're always um, in process. So I have been writing stuff on technicity, and you know, there's this famous thing called the finished artifact fallacy, which says that you know no artifact is ever really finished. It's just a legal fiction when you hand it off, you know, from the, the maker to the buyer. And the story I liked about this is the, the um, Frank Lloyd Wright's building in Pennsylvania called Falling Water. I know the story. When the buyer got it, he renamed it Rising Mildew because <laughs> it was built over a stream. That's why it's called Falling Water. And there are all these mildew problems and all these maintenance issues. So he had bought the place, but it's not like the process of individuation stopped. You know, it's, it's continuing. Same thing with computers. You buy a computer, but it gets viruses to separate them down. And there's this whole problem with technological trash and what to do with all the computers. All that is part of the process. And I think that's the point of saying it's production, right? It's always process. It's a process of individuation. It's never the thing itself. So that threw me for a loop because that's not what I was expecting. I thought it was about space, partly about space and, and how it constructs space, but not, um, uh, not, not just that, which is how I interpreted your last line. Architecture is not produced by free will, but by free necessity. Because the loser's point is what gives necessity to philosophical concepts. I'm sure it's the same thing with architectural you know, productions is the problem you're dealing with. You don't just create willy nilly, it's because you're gripped by a problem and that's what generates uh, whatever you're doing, even if you're not always conscious of what that <clears throat> particular problem might be. So that's my first point, uh, just of um, how the book opens. And then I personally had a second question I was bringing to this, uh, this book and I was looking, looking for the answer and I sort of found it. Um, <clears throat> which was, uh, well, I found it, but didn't find it, Deleuze's concept of the fold. So I work on in philosophy, I work on Deleuze, and I know from experience, a lot of people are saying, well, the fold has become this kind of architectural uh, concept, but every time I read about it or heard about it, it's just like, well, you know, I don't know what, you know, <laughs> you know, it's a spatial thing, and it never really seemed all that, I would say it's not interesting, but kind of a use uh, in, in architecture. And uh, so that's on page 135, where you get around to talking about the fold. And indeed, it's not what my uh, cliche, naive image uh, thought about it. So this is a quote. If the fold has any importance, so you're quoting someone who speaks, I uh, forget the first name. Yeah, it's Mikey Speaks, like his introduction on the book uh, of Dead Land Cast, uh, Ed Moves. Uh, the introduction to Cast. Yeah, 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 perfect. And the fold was popular back then, you know, uh, in the late uh, 80s, early 90s. It was, there was, it had a moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I like this line because uh, if the fold has any importance, it would be in folded architectural practice and not in folded architectural forms. That's the same thing, like not folding your you know, architecture, but it's in how, how practice itself um, becomes folded. Okay. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Then? Folded architectural practice. <clears throat> and then a couple of pages later, there's this quote. The value of the fold or the membrane when examined as a proper architectural problem and not merely as a formalizable or as a formalist gesture is that it can collapse the architectural world. Uh, and I thought, well, great, you're getting yourself on the job here because uh, if the fold uh, collapses the architectural world, well, uh, and what is that? Uh, that, that became like another question to me. And I sort of see, I think, where you're getting at, and this is going to be the third point you've already sort of touched on. This. Below says this line where he talks about individuation both creates individuals, but it's capable of destroying them because the condition of creation is also the condition of, of destruction. So you destroy your architectural world, collapse it, but that precisely becomes the condition for the production of the new, becoming new. But that's, too easy a, a, a way to, uh, to put it. So I like that because that's the one question, pre-given question I came into the book, uh, this sort of thinking about the 
Oh, and um, uh, that's the first time I've heard it explained that way. But, uh, yeah, I agree with that. <clears throat> that's good. So my third point then, and I want to spend a little more time on this, but not too much. I'm not going to do that. Um, with the title of the book. <laughs> in the larval space. As I say, I could tell that was coming from Briere, and it's interesting to pull Briere into um, architecture, but uh, Briere, who I quite like, and I've been reading as well, is a philosopher of bi biology, as I say, interested in embryos. I was curious how larval space, space of a larva, <laughs> is going to fit into architectural uh, theory. So I confess on my PDF, uh, <laughs> But the chapter I read most closely was the final chapter on uh, larval space. And Stowers has already talked about this, but the, the thing that really struck me here is this kind of threefold sort of demarcation of, of artifacts and technologies or technicities. Um, I don't think you, I don't know if you mentioned Cap, but I think a lot of this comes from Ernst Cap, who was a 19th century contemporary of Marx, who was the first person to write a book that had philosophy of technology in the title. And his whole theory was that technological artifacts, including I presume architecture, are externalizations or projections or extensions of bodily organs and functions. So I can drink with a cupped hand, but then if I make a cup, that's an extension of this out here. A baby's bottle is an extension of the mother's breast. Clothing, an externalization of skin. Uh, your kitchen and utensils, they're an extension of your digestive tract, like pre-masticating food when you cut it. And and pre-digesting it when you, when you cook it. So you can go down the list, uh, telescopes and microscopes are extensions of the eye to the point where, this was his claim, we have an externalized body around us. That's an expanded, amplified version of our body. That's what all this is. I'm mean, gonna put it in, uh, uh, biologists now might say it's a, it's a constructed niche. You know, it's either one or the other. You know, you, you build the environment. So I say architecture is now a built environment. <laughs> uh, the name of the school here. When did that happen, by the way? I sort of missed the new word, uh, built environment. I'm sure it's a long time ago. Um, but it's interesting because that's what Cap was getting at. You can see they're both the same thing. Either we have a niche we constructed or again, a, a, an extended uh, body. And you don't think about this because we really just inhabit this environment uh, more or less uh, all the time. But it's really an extension of of uh, the body. And then the question is that uh, you get to, well, what's the status of, of this body we have? Because lots of species have you know, built environments, termites build mounds and birds build nests and beavers build dams and spiders build webs. It's not like we're the only ones who modify our environment in this way. Um, and a, a concept I found most fascinating, and you talked about it, was detachment. There's something about the human species that our technological artifacts get detached from our organic body. Not entirely, they're obviously dependent on us. We build them, we make them. But other species, it seems to be what we call uh, genetic or instinctual. You know, bees are born to make hives and spiders are born to make uh, webs. In fact, some people say the web is really an organ of spider, it just happens to be outside of the body, it's part of their species. Something happens uh, with humans uh, that artifacts get detached. And like, I've been looking around for an answer of why. And the best, and you talked about this in passing, um, is Le Paul Guron. Yeah. And he says the reason uh, it, they become detached is just it's morphological. Uh, it's the upright position. But he says three things happen in the upright position. The Lewis will call this deterritorializations or pause. Used to be yeah, animals like that. Uh, were deterritorial. Like literally, they came off the earth, the terre in French, right? They became deterritorialized and in the upright position. They no longer were used for locomotion and they became hands, which Aristotle called like an all purpose tool. You can grasp, you can pound, you can punch, you can poke. Uh, this is where all technicity comes from. It's all coming from the hand. At the same time, the mouth, which used to be used for prehension, and most animals grab their food with the mouth. Uh, lost that prehensile function because that was taken over by the hands and that freed up the mouth for speech. So we get language. And then the third thing that happens is the brain grows, not because uh, we're the smartest animals on the planet, he says, but just 
On a vert in the vertical position, the brain can grow bigger because in the horizontal position, if the brain gets too big, uh, you should your skeleton can't, can't hold it up. It's, just, it's as simple as that. It's a morphological question of how the body is constructed. So we have bigger brains, not because we